get it overlapped. Some of the drugs, Abbott, you can see from here, they're coming up with drugs for viruses. That's the biggest challenge these days. And uh, those of you who decide uh, to go in industry, uh, this is a Pelivizu map. If you pay attention, A, B is antibody, M is monoclonal antibody, and this is a IgG1K, a humanized monoclonal antibody they produce by recombinant DNA technology. So what it does is it's directed towards a particular antigenic site of a protein on a virus. Okay, so if you block that, you're going to help those newborns. That's the whole point. So the most important thing that I'm going to discuss right today is respiratory syncytial virus. This is very important. And uh, <clears throat> this is a group of viruses. We kind of put them together. Uh, must have heard measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, MMR. But I would include para-influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, and this because they have many things in common. Now, again, uh, you can see from here, uh, I didn't bother to update since 2015, the recommendations by CDC, by all those authorities. You can see all those authorities, the world authorities, U.S. authorities, they suggest from birth through six year old. And you can see over here, the point is that many of the vaccines are targeted towards viruses. So I want you to know, as a part of this course is, why are we giving vaccine and what does those vaccine contain and what is the pathogenesis for that? And you can see from here, hepatitis B. You can see over there, we talk of polio. You can see over here, we talk about hepatitis A, for example. This was not there a couple of years ago, but you can see it's been added over here. Varicella, MMR, right? And then we have influenza given yearly and some of the other bacterial uh, vaccines. So vaccination is important and uh, this is something which is within the premise of pharmacists. So this is high time for you to get a good hold on that. And again, uh, <clears throat> this is another good list of the vaccine preventable diseases and the name of the vaccines. So it kind of lists everything that's there in terms of bacteria and viruses. I'm not going to ask you much uh, for bacteria in biology, not on, on Friday. You may get some questions for the uh, coming up exam for Friday in terms of vaccines for those bacteria that we discussed. But you can see that the vaccine contains something and there is a pathogenic mechanism that we, will, we are discussing. We will discuss on each and every viruses. And that's something you need to know in terms of uh, how can vaccine be held for? It's just a question to you. Somebody say, why do you want my newborn to get vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus? We want you as a pharmacist to answer this question based upon the information that we provide to you, okay? All right, now uh, <clears throat> again, when we talk of RNA viruses, this is the first lecture, again, give you a important concept of what is a negative strand in RNA virus. I've been adding some of the questions that you must have noticed, positive strand, single strand, and there is a very important bearing of this information uh, on, on, on these viruses. These are some of the uh, negative stranded RNA viruses, and you can see the list of them over here. But let's start with paramyxoviruses. This is a big family uh, divided into uh, three major parts. All of them end with viruses. You can see morbidly virus, paramyxovirus, and pneumovirus. And again, as I said, sometimes when virologists are very kind to you, they would add pneumo, suggesting you it's going to go and affect the lungs. So uh, in the human pathogens, when we talk of human pathogens and when we talk of morbidly virus, we are talking about measles virus. When we talk of paramyxovirus, we are talking about parainfluenza and mumps virus, right? And when we are talking about pneumoviruses, we are talking about two viruses. One is respiratory syncytial virus and other is meta-pneumovirus. So these are like classification 
There are quite a good charts in your book. So uh, you may want to uh, look at them. So if you go over here and look at measles virus, for example, this causes serious generalized infection, and you see a rash. This is called maculopapular rash. The other name for it is called rubiola. It's different from rubella. So don't confuse that if it's a distractor for you. When you talk of para-influenza, uh, it's going to cause upper and lower respiratory tract infection. When we say mumps virus, it's going to cause a systemic infection. And resp respiratory syncytial virus, it may have a upper respiratory tract infection in children and adults. But most important thing is that give you the impact uh, picture with a newborn pneumonia in infants. That's a serious issue. And that's why I gave you the drug which has been marketed by Abbott. Now, if you look at paramyxoviruses, again, same routine over and over again. You will see from here, for example, virus will get attached and then will be uncoat. And then in this particular cases, you can see from here that it is going to trans uh, translate, transcribe, translate into proteins. And they have all different components of viral assembly. And then it's going to either pick up, you can see from here, uh, the envelope outside and then bud out. So this is the most important thing that you normally see. The point in this case is that uh, many a time, if it is a, because in this particular, you can see from here, things are not happening in the nucleus, they're happening in endoplasmic reticulum. So that's important for this kind of viruses. The other important thing is messenger RNA, especially uh, if it is either a negative sense or a positive sense. So these are two important things that you have to keep in mind, and they are important in terms of uh, the treatment. I'm going to talk about that. So typical paramyxovirus, you can see from here, we have a uh, <coughs> genetic material inside. And this genetic material, sometimes it comes with uh, some enzyme, in this case polymerase, with the two proteins over here. Then we have a helical nucleocapsid, right? And then those spikes, remember we said those glycoprotein spikes. In this case, you either have H, N, H, G, or F glycoprotein. Remember, I just gave you an example for this particular antibody, which is monoclonal antibody targeting with F protein. So it's going to stop the attachment. So we have an F protein over here, which is a glycoprotein. And these are these kind of uh, proteins which are there on the periphery, and they are like suction cups attached. And these are some of the proteins that we talked about, you know, going to attach to respect, uh, respective receptors. And I'm going to talk about these glycoproteins in detail uh, because some of the drugs are targeted. For example, you must have heard about this term H1N1. So these are the, they talk of flu of H1N1. So what are these H191? They are glycoprotein expressed on the surface of these particular viruses. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> some of the <clears throat> Features of paramyxoviruses, again, uh, negative RNA genome, that's important. And remember I said they had two important glycoprotein, H. So this H stands for heme agglutinin. So H is coming from heme agglutinin, no matter where it is, on whichever virus it is. Right. And when we say N, neuraaminidase. So these neuraminidase is for N. So these are two important. And you can see some of the viruses may have both. And some of the virus may have one. And some of the virus may have none. And some of the virus may have other proteins other than H and N. So if I tell you there's a drug targeted for H, it's not going to be affected against a virus that is F protein. And some of the viruses like fusion protein F for fusion, uh, was there in respiratory uh, syncytial virus. The other important thing is that uh, we kind of differentiate between a bigger family, paramyxo, 
on the basis of these specific glycoproteins. So we look at those, just like in H1, N1, H2, N2. So they are different, biochemically different receptor based upon their amino acid sequences, protein structure that we give them a different name. So in this case, uh, these three genera are differentiated uh, from heme, agglutinin, and neuraminidase, and we have drugs, and I'm going to talk about those drugs as well. They are specifically targeting, targeting those. And again, you can see that RSV lacks these activities because RSV may not have heme, heme, heme agglutinin, or neuraminidase. It has its own, which is a fusion protein F. In the previous picture, I told you that these viruses replicate in cytoplasm. And then again, remember when I said that these cells, they infect a cell, they kill the cell. So when the cells get killed, what happens is they tend to clump together. They tend to fuse together. So when they fuse together, and each one of them have a nucleus, if you look into the microscope, you will see a giant cell with multi-nuclear, multi-nuclei. So this picture of a cell having a giant cell appearance with multinucleated is also a typical presentation that we look at pathology. So if you look at pathology of the viral infection, this is what you get, okay? Uh, cell mediated immunity uh, would basically, uh, is required to control these kind of infections, okay? So this was for the general family. Let's pick up measles. For example, measles is very common. So if you look at the measles virus from here, and again, uh, I'm going to look at this one because it will be easier for me. <clears throat> Let's see if I could. So you can see from here, it's a measles virus. Again, there's an RNA over here, and these are those proteins express outside. You can see these proteins express outside and they have this lipid bilayer. So typic typically what are we even talking about? So if you look at those uh, legends of those proteins, this is a fusion protein. You can see from here. And then this one is heme agglutinin, right? And then there are other proteins which may be present on nucleus, we call nucleocapsid. And there are some other proteins which may constitute the whole sequence of these viruses. Now this virus, measles virus, when it comes and attaches you, and now remember I said that uh, I didn't want you to remember all the receptors on each and one of the viruses and all the receptors on the corresponding cell, but some of them I do because of the drugs, because I'm gonna tell you, hey, this is what is gonna happen. So in this case, you can see there are two type of uh, receptors present on the cell of interest, CD46 and CD150. So you can see CD46 and CD50, which are there. And one of the receptors will attach on this one. You can see from here, the virus has this receptor. It's going to bind to this receptor. So it's like a noose. It's going to bind it up and pull it in. Okay, so many a time we use those uh, antibodies to block those receptor entry, okay? The virus goes in, it starts synthesizing messenger RNA, it does, and starts making all those proteins, we talk about that, and all of them is happening in cytoplasm. They make all those HNN protein, they have a virus assembly, and then the virus kind of juts out from here, we call budding of the virus. So measles, in fact, divides in the cell, picks up everything and gets out of the system. So this is a typical pathophysiology of the, uh, of the measles virus. And you can see that right now we're looking at the important concept. Uh, that's why when I had you to look for um, novel drugs and all, this is from nature, it's not even in the textbook. So you can see that when they work on these new or novel drugs, they're going to target those proteins and find out what best can we do. And these may not be there in, in literature per se. But you can see from here, everything is happening in the cytoplasm and nothing is happening in the, in the, in the nucleus. Now, uh, 
This virus particularly has a large envelope. So this means it can be inactivity or dryness. The contagion period precedes the symptoms. We talked about that the other day. Uh, the host is limited to human. And if I tell you there is only one serotype, what will be your conclusion? The answer is in the next line. You get either you get measles or you get uh, uh, measles vaccine. You get immunity for the rest of your life. That's why we have it included. That's the difference between some of the things. No problem. When we as a medical students were taught about that, we were very happy. Everything's okay. Everything's taken care of. But things are changing over time because viruses are so getting smarter. We are seeing after all those vaccination in United States with everything we are again seeing new cases of measles. And you can see this is a graph put up by CDC and you happen to be here. Well, those of you in California, they are a bigger problem as compared to us sitting in Illinois, but we are seeing cases. I remember one of the pharmacy students told me that she had been vaccinated and she had measles. It's infectious. So guess what? If one gets it, so that's gonna be another factor over there. Okay, so this is something which is beyond the uh, kind of beyond our course to teach you how and why and what's happening. Now, the most important thing is measles is highly contagious, highly contagious, and it's transmitted from the person to person respiratory droplets. Again, it affects the virus track. We talked about the old thing that it goes into the lung, goes into the blood, and then it shows a systemic picture. One of the things that uh, this particular virus does is that it shows off as a rash. Right? I think in one of the lectures, uh, I'm gonna talk about these rashes in detail. The other important thing for this virus is that this virus has a liking for central nervous system. So it has a liking for central nervous system. And if it goes over there, even if you are healed, from infection, you got post-infection measles encephalitis. Very common question asked. Or you may have something we call subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So these are the two important things that you need to know when we talk of pathophysiology of measles, especially if it's coming up. Very good slide from your book. Again, you can see you can acquire measles from respiratory tract. It's going to uh, divide in respiratory tract, lymphatic spread goes to the blood from where wherever the blood takes it to conjunctiva, respiratory tract, urinary tract, small blood vessel, lymphatic vessel, and CNS. And all of these will show a particular disease. Good thing, statistically, is that these two are rare outcomes. And guess what? If they are rare outcome, even even if you get one out of 100 having this is serious in the kids, so we want you to know that most of the time the rash appears and you have immunity for uh, lifelong. But we as uh, pharmacists and physicians are more into that. Now, the question that you may ask the students, that patients may ask you is that what causes measles from a simple rash to go and affect central nervous system? Why is it it causes encephalitis? So these are three important things because like other viruses, we talked about HSV, right? They infect neurons, right? So these infect neurons. Then again, uh, post-infection encephalitis is immune mediated. And then again, if you get a defective variant of measles, that creates a disease which is called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, SSPE, which is very commonly asked in these kind of things. Again, I repeat, for if you, this is for varicella, but you can see that anything which is there in the neurons can get infected and appear as a rash, okay? Now, when we talk of time course of measles infection, you can see there's a prodromal period and these are the typical things that happen. The very first thing that will happen over here is viremia. And then we have respiratory tract symptoms. And then we have, we call it 
triple C. So these triple C stand for uh, cough, conjunctivitis, and coryza. And sometimes people say this is a CCCP as well, which is photophobia. And it comes with appearance of complex parts in the rash for the students, uh, for the for the students to remember, and for the patients. And uh, if you look at the antibody profile, typically what we've been talking about over time, IgM and IgG, and first one is an IgM, and then later on IgG will take over. So that's pretty much simple. If you look at the clinical picture, uh, this is a febrile illness. Incubation period is seven to 13 days. And when you have this triple C plus P, that's the most infection period, right? And then again, what when we were trained in infectious diseases, we were shown a typical complex part, I'm gonna show it to you in a while, that basically is important. Then we have uh, the rash, which is maculopapular, and then the rash basically fades over time. And uh, many a time, if I was to ask you which virus causes fever with rash. So fever with rash is typical of measles. Okay, and that's what I was talking about, complex rash over here, complex part, and that's a typical measles rash. But again, it will be very difficult to pick it up if you want to compare it with anything else. How do you control that? We have a live attenuated vaccine, which is available. And what I want you to know in this one, it is a live attenuated vaccine. Okay. And then again, you can also give immune uh, serum globulin uh, once, you know, a uh, person is exposed, right? And this is the last slide uh, for this particular virus. Uh, because it's a part of the childhood vaccination, measles, mumps, rubella. I want you to know the composition for these, especially measles. You can see it has a strain. Mumps has a strain. Rubella has a strain. And this is the vaccination schedule. And we have booster doses. And the good thing is 95% lifeline immunization. But remember, we are not concerned about 95% as health professional, we are concerned about that five person, because those five persons are going to come. It's just like, if nobody gets sick, why do you have physicians and pharmacists? What's the point? So we're not bothered about 95%. We're bothered about those five percent which are going to ask for help from us. That's why we see reactivation of measles, and we are just wondering how best can we treat that, okay? So let's stop here.